the um, uh, oriented clock. And uh, I want to welcome folks to uh, a Friday afternoon in December. And here you are watching a webinar from Cali. That's awesome. Thank you so much. My name is John Mayer. I'm the executive director of Cali, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. I'm your master of ceremonies today, but not the speaker. Um, we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing a session today on, on video to make in, in hopes that if you're a faculty member or you're supporting faculty members, you know, next spring, you can do another iteration of, of improvement or enhancement on what you've been doing with online learning. That, that's, that's the goal here. I want to remind you that we held a, uh, a mini course back in June and we recorded everything. I'll shoot myself down. You know, it's at onlineteaching.classcaster.net. If your faculty didn't see this back then, they can go there and they can, uh, they can watch the videos. There's seven hours of videos there. Uh, and every video, we've, we've got a transcript. We've got an MP3 version. So if they want to download that and listen to it while they're on the treadmill or walking a dog, we include their slides as well as a long list of all the links to articles or memes or um, software that any of the speakers uh, talked about. It's a, it's, it's a good resource for you to point your faculty to. Um, the other thing about this is, is that the classroom is a TV studio now, right? I mean, it sounds like it, it's, it's been turning into that for a while, right? You've been putting cameras in there. You've been improving the sound and things like that. But even the faculty who are at home are building these little mini TV studios for themselves to give their presentations on Zoom. And as luck would have it, just an hour ago, Dennis Kennedy tweeted this. I made a comment in this episode that my home office now seems like a video studio. Anyone else feel that way? And I'm like, that's exactly what this, or almost exactly what this webinar is about. So, um, uh, so, so we've got a fellow here by the name of Adam Stofsky, and we've worked with Adam because his company briefly makes videos specifically in the legal arena. Now, we first ran across him because he did a bunch of awesome videos for South Carolina Legal Aid. Um, and you can, you can go at the www.learnthelaw.org and click on the classroom for South Carolina and see some of them. Um, they're hilarious and engaging, and they teach self-represented litigants about legal problems like debt collection and eviction and stuff like that. Um, with that, we hired him, and he did our video on our What is Cali sort of introductory video that, um, that we push at students and faculty so that they can quickly learn in three or four minutes, you know, what, what, what Cali is all about. So he's also a lawyer, which is great because that means he understands us or our space. Um, and he's a graduate of Amherst and Harvard Law School. And now it's time to hand it over to Adam and say, Adam, it's all yours. So I will stop sharing. And let you I will hopefully start sharing. Thanks, John. I appreciate the intro. It was fun seeing that screenshot of our South Carolina video with our scary with Clark. Character, character. Yeah, and Clark. Yeah, we have a we made a, a sort of a mascot for South Carolina Legal Services. This the hot dog. The hot dog. <laughs> just a walking hot dog. Um, so yeah, well, I'll get into all this. Um, you know, in a way, I, I think you know everyone's office isn't so much a TV studio is that everyone's become a live streamer. This is sort of in, in 2020 parlance, you know, what, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a different, a little bit of a different beast. Um, but yeah, as John mentioned, I'm a lawyer turned entrepreneur and, and producer. And uh, my company briefly is mission is to make legal information more accessible to everyone. And we do it in a variety of ways, including producing content on a custom basis for legal aid organizations, courts, um, you know, some private companies. Um, and we, we tend to make very short form, engaging video. We, we work with this whole range of interesting people. We work with game developers, we work with animators, um, illustrators, and we bring in all these creative capacities to take this frankly often arcane and challenging stuff and make it as accessible as possible. Ideally in an evidence-based way, we're trying to get as much data as we can on what moves people, what helps them understand legal issues, what helps them get over the emotional challenges of engaging with legal issues, um, what actually changes behaviors. It's hard to figure this out, but, um, but we're trying. So, and you can just see here, this is a random set of images from a bunch of our, um, a bunch of our work. 
So for today's webinar, um, I'm going to kind of, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. I was trying to think of what's going to be most useful to, you know, law faculty or law librarians. And, you know, the bottom line is there's just so much to talk about here. I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff together and hope you get something out of it. Uh, it'll be a mix of kind of talking you through a taxonomy of types of content. Um, and then a bunch of practical tips uh, on, on how to improve the quality of your content. Then we'll go into a Q&A and, and I can stick around for a while and, um, and answer questions. So let's just, and you can also feel free to throw questions in the chat as we go. Or, you know, if you're, an ex, I'm, I'm assuming at least some of you are pretty experienced, you know, e amateur producers or live streamers um, or whatever you do, feel free to like throw things in the chat, especially if you disagree with something I say. If you think that piece of software is terrible, you like this one instead or whatever it is, I really like to engage with questions as we go. So feel free to drop something in the chat. And John, if you can kind of moderate and point out interesting questions to me, that would be, um, that would be really welcome. Great. For sure. All right. So let's dive right in, right? So, you know, we're in a, in a pandemic, right? So a lot of, we're not really going out and, and, and making a lot of um, documentary style videos. What kind of content are we making? And so I've kind of pulled out a few types of content that I think are going to be most useful to you. By far the most important is going to be um, screencasts and live streams, which I'll talk about extensively. Um, so, but, but first I want to start with writing and graphic design. And, and this is its own kind of content, right? Like anything you write that is on a piece of paper or a web page or a PDF needs to be well-written and needs to be well-designed. And most of the time it's not. And, and I think I, I put this here because I think a lot of people, a lot of professionals, but especially lawyers, they, they kind of underestimate two things. One is they underestimate the importance of some sort of basic graphic design in making their, what they write readable and engaging. And, and they also don't realize that when making any kind of content that the writing is really important. The writing underlies everything. When you do a podcast episode, when you do a screencast, you need to write it first, right? Even if it's a piece of audio, even if you know the stuff like the back of your hand, you need to write it to kind of pace it out. So writing and just very basic graphic design is at the heart of everything we're gonna talk about and you, you can't ignore it. And it's also a kind of content in and of itself. I think when you write anything, even like, your course syllabus, right? This is like the roadmap of what students are gonna be doing for the next three or four months. It's a critically important document and often they're just not well designed, but it's just screaming for like fun, basic graphic design, information design to make it interesting. So it is both a kind of content and the, un the sort of foundation of every other kind of content. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about screencasts. So what is a screencast? I mean, this is a screencast, right? A screencast is, is anytime you are um, uh, looking at a computer screen that is being recorded and a person either speaking an audio or, or, um, or video and audio over it. That's it. It encompasses a whole variety of kinds of genres of video. Um, you know, I tend to think of screencasts as a bit of a distinctive form from the webinar. When I think of webinars, I think of kind of hour long or 40 minute long educational presentations where screencasts tend to be either, you know, shorter form, um, you know, sh sh shorter form presentations or, you know, a kind of YouTube content. And there's like sort of, I don't know, I'm sure some of you watch videos on YouTube, but there's just a wide variety of, of genres of, of kind of modern YouTube or streaming video that are screencasts, but it's all about recording a computer screen mixed with someone talking. Um, all right, so why are screencasts great for lawyers, for legal professionals? Um, for one thing, they're really easy to do yourself, right? They're pretty inexpensive to record. You can make them in PowerPoint, like this one is made in PowerPoint. The content can be delivered by anyone. You don't need to like hire a voice actor or have you know, some kind of famous interview subject to make it compelling, just you, right? Or, or, or someone who you know who's engaging. Um, they're really easy to update, right? So you might make other kinds of video that are you know, like motion graphics or, or, or some kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of live video or documentary that are challenging to update. This you can update just by like changing a slide. Like we do legal information videos, right? And especially now during COVID, like stuff's changing all the time, especially around, you know, evictions and eviction moratorium laws. And we're having to update these things constantly. Um, with, with a screencast, we can just go and update the slide deck really quickly. It's in PowerPoint. You change it in a couple minutes and then whichever lawyer is doing the presentation just does it again, or even does that little 30 second section and we can edit it in pretty easily. So they're really easy to update, which also means they're easy to test and iterate on, which is you know, really important if you're gonna get in the business of doing a lot of content. 
Screencasts also lend themselves to explaining documents. You can put the document on the screen and, and you can use screencast software to kind of call out certain sections of the document. You can just allows you to explain a document in a kind of engaging and believe it or not, maybe even kind of fun way. <laughs> uh, we've done this a lot. We have a, a lot of um, content we're making based around major life events, educating new parents and, and folks who have become caregivers to aging adults. And we do a lot of explaining like boring, scary documents. And we get a lot of feedback that we do it in this very engaging way. And a lot of that's because we're kind of, you know, looking at this thing on a screen, it's a bit absurd and, and it gives you some room to, you know, to, you know, add humor and, and, and pacing to explaining a legal document. Okay. Maybe I overstated that a bit, but it is, you know, I think, I think it is an advantage for lawyers. Um, the other thing about screencasts is that it's just similar to the kinds of content that people are watching online, right? Like all these Gen Zers who are coming into law school now, they're used to watching YouTube streamers they are used to watching Twitch. That's the kind of content they watch. So this will be very, very familiar to them, especially those younger audiences. Um, some disadvantages of screencasts, you know, they, they can tend, because it's kind of us talking, they can be longer and they can be less engaging um, than other kinds of content. You know, the, the, the thing about screencasts, this goes to what John was saying before about people not being able to see the slides, is that they are very dependent upon the speaker, right? No matter how great your slides are, <laughs> it just depends on how good the speaker is, the quality of a, screen, of a, of a screencast or a live stream we'll talk about in, in a little bit. Um, the flip side of you being able to do it yourself is it does require a lawyer's time or an expert's time. And it can be pretty stressful, actually, to, to record these things. You got to get in front of your computer and you're performing. So that is a disadvantage. Um, you also need to meet certain basic quality standards because folks are used to just a basic level of audio and visual quality. You need to um, get a, a grip on. Okay, so how to make great legal screencasts. So <laughs> this is a really, really bad way to make a legal screencast. Just take a quick look at this. This slide is pretty much what, actually probably a slightly better designed version of what most, when I see like any kind of legal presentation at a conference, this is what they tend to look like. Um, this is what I wanna see. This is the exact same content on this slide and this slide. So I'm gonna talk you through some tips. I think, this is just one guy's opinion and feel free to disagree with me is that in any kind of screencast presentation, this could be a Twitch streamer playing Fortnite for 10 hours straight or a lawyer giving a presentation at a conference, at least 90% of the quality of that screencast isn't, it's about the charisma and, and knowledge and um, just sort of presentation quality of the presenter themselves, the person or people involved. The slides are going to be like 10%, right? They're just not that important. Just think back how many amazing, amazing slide decks can you think of? Probably not many, but great speakers, probably a lot. So this is a common, um, a common mistake people make. You know, then I'll jump to number five is you don't narrate a deck, right? A deck is just a visual aid to help your audience understand what you're talking about or just sort of to help, um, you know, even to help you as a bit of an outline. This is even more true in live streams like this, where you're live and have to kind of be on the ball. Um, number two, so this is something I'm clearly not following right now, <laughs> but slow down your words and speed up your paragraphs. And what I mean by this is that people often get nervous and talk too quickly, um, but they also then repeat themselves and go on too long in a structural, um, from a structural sense, right? So, yeah, thank you, Mark. I, I, yeah, it is, it's, um, it's not a good thing. Uh, to just read your deck. So, so speed up your paragraphs, slash out paragraphs you don't need. Speed up your overall deck, but slow down what, what you do say, what stays in, um, slow it down. Um, use stories, maybe that's obvious. You know, you, I think, you know, a, a sort of ab abstraction, too much abstraction can be, um, can be tough, especially in a long form presentation. Um, and then something that I think people overlook is that screencasts can actually be much more even though you're, you're in a computer, right? They can be much more intimate than lectures, right? Like with a lecture, if someone's sitting in a lecture hall or even a small classroom, you're far away from the professor, you're far away from your students. With a screencast, you're actually really right up in people's faces. And people kind of overlook that. And it lets you do certain things and evoke certain emotions um, that you couldn't otherwise do. Um, so those are just some, some quick tips for making great schemes. We'll get into some technical 
um, advice soon about kind of microphones and, and cameras and, and things like that. Okay, live streams. Um, what is a live stream? Live stream is, and I know there's going to be people who know this, so forgive me, um, but I'm just going to go through it pretty quickly. A live stream is just a live presentation on the internet. It's usually a screencast. It doesn't have to be. It can be, you know, an image of someone dancing around their room. As long as it's live, it's a live stream. Live streams are growing tremendously, especially during the pandemic. Um, one of the fastest growing live streaming platforms is Twitch. Um, Twitch, and this is data that I have from 2019. I can't even imagine what the 2020 data is like, but Twitch had nearly three, 3 billion hours of content viewed. For those of you who don't know, Twitch was, was started as a platform to allow people to watch other people play video games. It's still primarily what it does, but they're getting into other um, kinds of content. You know, music live music, sports, but a lot of experts as well are getting on these platforms and, um, you know, and teaching people. Obviously, there's Facebook Live, Instagram, YouTube. I have Mixer. I don't know if anyone even uses Mixer anymore, but those are the, um, the main uh, platforms. So I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, with live streams, the, this balance between the visual and the presenter is just shifted much more towards the presenter, right? It's really entirely about how good the presenter is. And, and part of this is because I think that the there's an energy to live, right? Which just makes a huge difference. And, and sort of what you're, oh yes, yeah, so as people are talking about, about Twitch and they're, yeah, I'm sure they're preteens and teenagers are, that's a demographic um, that tends to be really, really into Twitch, watching Minecraft and Fortnite and things like that. Anyway, not to get too far afield, it's kind of crazy to me. Um, so people are often tempted to get like famous people to come on their live streams as a way to get people there. And this is true for, you know, for law professors as it is for just any brand. It tends to be, it tends to be a bit risky because when you get a, when you get a guest on, they can be kind of, you know, they can kind of dial in and be overrated. Um, yeah, so not, a, not a great strategy. Focus on yourself. Um, you know, keep a really simple setup. Just focus on your audio primarily. Make sure you can monitor your video like you can on Zoom. You know, uh, learn a bit about editing so you can cut out any rough edges to post later, but keep things really, really simple. You don't want your technology to mess up. And this is true for everything. I mean, you guys are, are doing classes. I'm assuming a lot of what you're doing is not asynchronous, it's live. And so just keep everything as, as simple as possible. So live means scarcity. This is really more of a more of a marketing point, but I suppose you're all marketers to some degree too. But when you do a live event, something about what is live should be important, right? It's, it's something that's being unveiled for the first time, or, or it's just going to be, or it's going to go away. It's just going to happen once and be gone. So, you know, that scarcity is a tool you can use when kind of marketing whatever content you're making. And also practice like crazy. You just have to practice a lot. There's no substitute. Live streaming is really, really hard. Being a good presenter online, um, it's just really hard. You're doing it without getting feedback from your audience. Um, you just have to practice a lot and get a lot of feedback. Um, okay, moving on from, and we'll, again, like I said, we'll get to some of the equipment recommendations soon. I'm speaking very quickly to get through this content, so apologies about that. Um, so I'm going to talk about two kinds of, of um, live video. I don't mean live like live as in live stream. I mean, live like video of live people, basically. Um, so the first is archival material. I think this is really underutilized by, um, by lawyers in general and by law faculty. There is a huge amount of free, well, and frankly, also very expensive stuff out there you can use. But you know, archival material, it can be an amazing resource for teaching. We, we did a, I did a video in my, in my last organization, the New Media Advocacy Project. We, we made a, a video um, called Defending Gideon about the, um, it was for the 50th anniversary of Gideon v. Rainwright. And um, Gideon, so we found, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the interesting chat. I'm going to stop doing this. So the, the uh, we, we, we ended up finding, so Clarence Earl Gideon actually, I forgot exactly when, but several years after the argument, there was a, a recreation of the oral argument. And, um, you know, they had some actors doing it and some of the lawyers were there. And it was this incredible kind of piece of archival material. We were able to use it to kind of replicate what was going on in the argument um, and incredibly useful. It was a little bit expensive, but it was, it was great. But anyway, here's a, a sort of list of some resources. All this stuff will be in the materials I send. Um, but, but, you know, particularly we were talking about, we were talking about Oye yesterday. I don't know if, if people here use OA, but if you think of it not just as a sort of research tool, but as actually a source for actual audio content, 
um, or, or text content, it can be really, really great. So that's archival. You know, advantages, um, it might be your only option for using actual humans in your video, aside from you, actually, because you can't go out and it's not easy to interview people these days. Um, it can just be great for storytelling or if you're doing any kind of narrative content for B-roll, which is the visual material that that um, is sort of um, covers your interviews when doing a documentary style video. Um, you know, it, you can often get good looking stuff because it's shot by professionals, which can allow you to make a really good looking video if you're not a professional. Um, and it can also, if you can find free stuff, it can be um, pretty inexpensive. Some disadvantages, it can also be really expensive if you go to sort of Reuters or, or one of the, or Getty or one of the great archives, that's gonna be expensive. It can also be time consuming to find what you need. And also there can be technical challenges to some old, um, uh, to finding, uh, you know, to, if things are in the wrong format if they're old. Sorry, so Jill has just asked about suggestions for free background music. Yes, I have a number of those suggestions. They didn't make it into this deck, but they will be in the, um, the materials I send. There's just a bunch of free music libraries. You can Google one called Pond5 right now, P-O-N-D number five. You can even just do it um, when you get bored with me talking. And there's a lot of, there's a bunch of libraries out there. So I'll link to a bunch of them in the, the follow-up materials. Um, Okay, so um, the next is role plays and simulations. I know a lot of folks are are, um, are playing around with this, <laughs> um, and to be honest, it's not it's not really my expertise. I've worked with some people who are, who are um, you know have a lot of expertise in doing really like large multi party negotiation setups using video and remote video in really interesting ways. Um, but just a few observations from what I have done is that when you're getting Getting started, stick to simple scenarios, one-on-one -on -one or maybe three, like simulating a you know, lawyer, a witness, and a, and a judge. Keep it simple because the technical screw-ups will really slow things down. Challenging. Um, you know, take advantage of that close-up format, right? This is actually a, the, the things you can do with kind of, you know, sort of analyzing facial expressions. Really, people forget that you're really right up in people's faces when you're in a webcam. Uh, situation, so you can take advantage of that and, and make and make good use of that. Um, so yeah, also you can record. I think back like if, I don't know if anyone used to record themselves doing any kind of sports. Like if you played a sport like tennis or soccer, and they always have those recordings, and you you looked so much worse than you thought you did. At least that was my experience. Um, record people <laughs> and then play it back and use that. That alone is a, an amazing tool for especially for you know burgeoning litigators. Um, you can use the the recording feature is a really um, just a great experience in and of itself. If anyone does this, I'm really curious. I'd love to hear if you've had success recording and playing back video for students as they practice um, any aspect of, of lawyering. Um, oh, so there's a typo there. So Zoom uh, is not ideal for this. I would use Teams or go to meeting or go to webinar just as it lets you arrange the, um, the faces on the screen in a much more flexible way. Um, you know, later on, do this in person if possible. But I think it's actually a pretty good thing you, a pretty good thing to do with, um, you know, this remote situation that we're in. Okay, finally, audio. You know, I probably don't need to tell you that podcasts have become insanely popular. The data is staggering. Actually, they've gone down. You can jump back down down here, and you see um, there's been less, actually, less listening during COVID. This isn't going to be relevant to you guys unless you really want to. Um, you know, make money on podcasts, um, which I'm sure most of you aren't, aren't endeavoring to do that. But listenership has gone down probably because of less gym time and less commuting time and more time with kids at home and things like that. Um, but, you know, the great thing about podcasts, well, I'll just summarize all this to say, I think audio in general is underutilized. I think doing audio lectures or just audio content keeps things really simple. It's pretty easy to do well. You can record it while you're walking around, right? Which might have advantages for certain people. They're more relaxed. They're more engaged. And people like listening to audio, right? I, I, so I think, I just think in general, if you have something interesting you want to record or say, try it as an audio piece. You, know, you don't need to record everything on video, especially if you have nothing else visual to show. All that kind of um, presenter charisma that you have can come out when you're doing audio. So I would encourage everyone to think about this as, as an idea and test it with their, you know, their students or their, you know, or their, or their audience. Um, okay. So those, that's the taxonomy of, of types of content. Like I said, I do think that, 
you know, screencasts and live streams are really the, the bulk of what most of you guys are going to be doing. But think about these other kinds of content too. Um, you know, and, and think about the particular advantages each of these have, like, you know, scarcity with live streaming or just, you know, the ability to kind of untether yourself from a screen with, um, with, uh, with audio. So lots of different advantages. All right. So let's go into some practical tips. And again, I'm going to kind of race through a lot of content here and, and don't worry about writing stuff down. It'll all be in the materials I send afterwards. So, okay. First, focus on writing first. I mentioned this already, and I'm going to say it again, because it's really critical is that writing is at the heart of every content project, everything you do, you know, even if you're interviewing someone else, right? You need to write it first. You need to write, obviously your interview questions, but also you need to write, you know, write your perfect resolution of that interview, write the sort of write out the pacing, write out what you want it to feel, what you want your listeners to feel. Um, write it out and, and sort of write and plan everything. Yeah, John is saying script, exactly. You know, you also want to balance. You don't want to be too, if you're doing things live and you don't want to, you can't be too tethered to your script, but you need to be able to go off your script. You need to have a script to go off of. And it's it's um, really, really critical. Now, I will say for for doing screencasts like this, I, I would do not recommend writing a word for word script, right? This is why I kind of get away from the word script and thinking more about writing the piece. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but I just find almost every presenter, especially a presenter with expertise is far more engaging when they're not reading something. And it's so tempting, especially if you're like a bit of a risk averse lawyer, even lawyers who are like great presenters in court, they'll just lock into reading that script and it's really bad. And the minute you take away the script from them and they start talking, um, it's so much better, right? So I like to do detailed bullet points. The other one is, the other problem is technical, right? So, you know, when I'm scripting stuff, I, I, you know, you're, so I'm looking at a presenter view in my slide deck now. You guys are seeing the, the full deck on a second screen, a second monitor. But if you're writing and, you, and you're reading stuff, you're kind of, I'm exaggerating now, but even, even if you're, you're, you're pretty good at this, I'm looking down and reading like this and I dart up to the camera and I'm looking down and it's, um, it's distracting. If you look at some really great YouTube streamers, like pick a topic you're really interested in and go Google and listen to find the, the best like streamer who like grows roses in their garden. There's probably some, some amazing rose growing streamers. Just go watch them. And they're really, really great. You can tell they're subtly reading something. You'll see their, their eyes dart down, but they're really focused on the camera. So these are all reasons to, to think about writing I'm disagreeing with John slightly about the idea of scripting, um, if, uh, you know, word for word, but just make sure you write everything. Okay. Um, so think about scalability. If you're going to get into producing a lot of content, it can be expensive, either in terms of time or money, if you're hiring any kind of vendor to help you with it, but it can scale very well. So if you are going to spend time and money, invest that time and money in things that are going to, you know, be efficient. So for example, invest in some kind of style guide. This might sound crazy if you're just like a professor who wants to do better lectures or whatever, but no, like invest, come up with a, a look and feel for your stuff. A couple of typefaces that look good, a couple of, you know, template decks that can work really, really well with your lectures. You know, if you really want to get into it, we often will create these kind of house styles for organizations, right? This is if you have a lot more resources or, or getting really into content creation. But, you know, you can have, I hate to say it's a little cheesy, but this idea of a kind of personal brand, I guess, I, I don't know, I kind of reject that sort of thing, but it's, 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 there's probably some truth to it, right? So you can invest in, you know, a style, a look and feel, or even just a set of slides that, um, that you can then use to make your next slide deck much, much cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as you build up more templates. So think about scalability, think about replication, repetition, and kind of iteration as you do this, instead of starting everything from scratch. So screencasting, I recommend everyone, you know, who's making content at all, try this and do some screencasting. So how do you do it? So a lot of folks use Zoom and I'm going to strongly encourage people away from using Zoom for screen uh, for screencasting. It's there, right? It's free. So, you know, don't not use Zoom if that's all you've got, but there's other options that I think are better. And I'll recommend three options here in a sort of big range. Um, well, the first is OBS, which is the open broadcaster software, which is a free application. It's used very heavily by folks live streaming on 
on platforms like Twitch. It's kind of optimized for, for that platform. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it is free, which is a great advantage. It's Mac and PC. I find it really, really hard to use. A lot of people don't. They, they just get it. They find it intuitive. For whatever reason, I find it challenging. I know other people do too. But you know, if you want to try this out for free, it's worth checking out. If you have a little bit of resources, there's two other pieces of software that I love. One is ScreenFlow. It's $130. It's only for Mac, unfortunately. And the other is Camtasia, which is uh, for Windows and Mac. And these are, they're basically video editing programs that allow you to record your screen and record your webcam. Oh, good. We have some Camtasia fans. Yes, it is. So yeah, it's basically it lets you record your screen and your audio and your webcam separately, and then you can edit them separately, right? And um, so, oh, good. We have some Camtasia fans. That's great. Uh, yeah, and that's you. So, so Deborah mentions that Camtasia has big education discounts. They do. It's a, it can be very very cheap for both um, both nonprofit and um, and uh, for edu for you know for for education. So just this is a, a just a little side by side to give you a quick flavor of like why how why these softwares are better than Zoom. You just have way way more control over um, you know how you edit the the webcam versus the deck, right? So here in the top, I've placed the speaker as big as I can in the lower right-hand corner, um, fitting in beautifully with the deck. So she's not obscuring any of the text. Whereas down below here in Zoom, I don't know what happened here, but this happens all the time where my, you know, my thumbnail image is really tiny and it's floating in the middle. It doesn't always happen. And you, you can control this in Zoom, but it can be very, very challenging. Um, so, and yeah, and someone just going back to the, the platforms here. So someone mentioned um, a, another program called Snagit. Snagit is kind of like Camtasia Lite. And it's like, I think 40 or $50 It's cheaper if you, yeah. So Deborah Sisha uses, you know, uses Snagit every day. It's also great. It's, you know, it's not quite as powerful. If you really want to get into producing screencasts, you need to get Camtasia. So you can really manipulate where, um, you know, where the webcam image is, you can really edit, but Snag, it's maybe great to get, um, great to get started. I've never used Screencast-O-Matic, Curtis mentioned, um, but you know, I, I, it's one of the ones that people talk about. Um, so, and actually uh, I know that um, TechSmith and makes Snagit and Camtasia had some really deep discounts for Black Friday. I'm assuming those will come back um, around Christmas. So great moment to, to buy them. One other thing I'll mention, I think you know, ScreenFlow is cheaper. It, it also is it's really easy to use. And um, one thing I will say is if you have a, if you're recording on a laptop like I am, I find that, that um, this is just anecdotal. I have a pretty powerful MacBook Pro that uh, ScreenFlow makes my fan go nuts. It's just using my computer's resources. And that fan noise is a, is a killer when you're recording straight in your laptop. Because you know, my mic is right here. I mean, it's it's a cardoid mic, which we'll talk about in a second. It's facing away from my computer, but it still picks up fan noise, which creates challenges, right? So, um, and just a quick, for those of you interested in training on Camtasia, stay tuned because I'm going to tell you about our, this is a shameless plug. I'm going to tell you about our pretty low cost subscription service at the end of this, but we could also do a separate Camtasia training as well. Um, you might want to think about, if you if you get excessive fan noise, like if you're recording on a, a small like a MacBook Air or like a or like a not very powerful computer, you 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 should um, set up your the the computer with your webcam that you're going to be looking at where your mic's going to be near. Set that up on your external monitor so you can have your mic away from your laptop, which is going to be going crazy with its fan and making this loud hum. So just a quick pro tip: it's a little harder, and you have to be careful of your eye line because you're usually looking up at a big monitor. But it's a it's a good um, uh, it's it's a good um, it's a good technique to avoid that fan noise. Yeah. So someone's saying that Camtasia also crap. You you do need to you know you you want to have eight gigs of RAM basically for for these things. So you may need to upgrade some some RAM as well. I I, I wanted to just mention Twitch here. <laughs> this is sort of like the twitchiest of Twitch screenshots that I could imagine. But it, it's you know Twitch is a live streaming platform. And what I want to emphasize here is that it, it's based a lot around creating a community around these streamers. So you see on the left, the list of, you know, sort of other channels that are similar to this person's channel. On the right, you have a chat that gives you options to engage with your audience. So, you know, I don't know. I think that Twitch is really underutilized. If you want to reach an 
audience that's not your immediate audience, like your class, especially Gen Zers, especially men actually, or boys, I think it's a really interesting thing to explore. I don't think many of us are gonna do it, um, but I think it's fascinating. And I really have no idea what this game is and don't wanna know what it is, but anyway, it's interesting. Okay, some other useful useful software. Audacity is a great free video uh, audio editing piece of software. You should all just download it and play around with it. Um, you know, Zoom, you can use to record audio in a pinch. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but it, it is easy because it just records your audio and, um, you know, and spits it out right onto your, onto your computer. Uh, Trint is actually a, it's one of several competitors now, but it's the one I like the most. It's a software platform that lets you record, uh, lets you um, easily transcribe audio content. It's not great, but it's probably almost as good as a live human transcriber. So um, it can be really, really useful if you have lots of content you want to search through. So someone mentioned they like editing in Final Cut Pro. I haven't used Final Cut in ages. I do use Adobe Premiere. I think if you want to get into video editing, Adobe Premiere Elements is a really good option. I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think Camtasia and ScreenFlow can allow you to probably do as much video editing as you need to do. But it's, it's worth checking out Adobe Premiere Elements as well. I mentioned before, royalty-free music um, or photo libraries. Pond5 is a good one. There's some others in the follow-up. Behance is Adobe's platform. It's like a freelancer platform, but they allow people to post uh, royalty-free photographs. So it's, it's a really nice free photo library there as well. And then you have Linda, Udemy, Khan Academy, and of course, YouTube for learning how to use all this software. You can find endless uh, trainings. I mean, we're talking about Camtasia training. I think we could do a really cool Camtasia training that focuses on you know, lawyers in this context. But if you just want general basic training, you can get all that stuff on, on, on Udemy um, for cheap and YouTube for free. All right, improve your audio. So I'm gonna go through this stuff pretty quickly. Um, you know, just there's the technical and then there's performance. You need to think about both with your audio. Number one is upgrade your mic. Many of you probably wanna upgrade your mic, but also learn your mic and learn how to use it. You know, in particular, learn where you need to be. Okay, so I'm gonna push back on, on Deborah's recommendation of Yeti mics. So they're the most popular. I don't love them. So, well, let me get, I'm gonna to get to some mic recommendations soon. Um, people do love the Yetis, but I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, three, make your recording space sync, right? So don't just think about your mic, think about your space. Smaller spaces with lots of um, soft stuff to absorb echoes makes a lot of sense. So if you can find small rooms, rooms with a lot of pillows, you know, a lot of the sort of audio folks I know, they go and they literally sit in their closets and they like fill their closets with blankets and pillows. It's crazy, but it really, really works. This cuts down on the, um, on the, on the echo. Learn some basic editing, download Audacity and just kind of learn how to do it yourself or like find someone who knows how to edit because um, you're going to want to do some editing of your of your audio and also learn some basic processing. So editing is, you know, editing the audio track itself, editing out your ums, editing it out, editing out the boring sections, whereas processing is improving the quality of the sound, um, which you can do in a variety of ways. Um, you can learn the basics pretty easily. If you're totally not inclined to do this, um, you know, find someone who does or even find a cheap vendor um, who can do it for you because you're going to want to do a little bit of audio editing. A lot of this is really obvious about performance. The one thing I'm going to focus on, well, two things, I'll say preparation is really important, right? You have to, you have to just prepare and practice a lot, but getting everything else out of the way. And what this goes back to the, the whole simple deck idea is that anything that's going to interfere with your sort of flow and your performance Get it out of the way. If you if there's a, a section, a topic you don't know that well, or you have a slide deck that you're confused by, or your setup is weird, fix that. Fix that stuff before you fix anything else, so that you can just talk. Um, so just get everything else out of the way. Um, yeah, John says, listen to yourself. Yeah, I have, and that's actually a, that's a reason why. Um, th that alone is a reason to get into a little bit of editing because it just forces you to listen to yourself and you're going to hear all those ums and realize, oh my God, I didn't realize I said um all the time or like, and you hear it and then you can fix it. And it's excruciating actually. <laughs> it can be excruciating in the beginning. Um, you know, it's like those videos of those poor students doing their 
you know, direct examination or, or, or their motion or whatever, but it's, it's really, really useful. Right. So Julia asks, how do you edit out breaths um, without having to do each one? <laughs> so this is a, this is a, this goes to what John said, listen to yourself. So you have to do each one, right? You just have, there's no shortcut. You can't have software find the breaths and edit them out. You have to go and edit them. And you have to hope that you're, you know, if you're doing this and kind of breathing in quickly as I sometimes do, and then you quickly start your word, you can't edit it at all because it just sounds terrible. So my suggestion, Julia, would be to listen to yourself and practice. And I, can, I guarantee you, if you spend, if you spend a couple of days editing out all those breaths, you know, or all those ums, and it's boring and it's awful. And then you go back the next time, you're going to be thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to slow down a bit and I'm going to, you know, breathe in a more controlled way. Well, then it's, you're going to just get better, right? So the best way to make it more quick and easy to edit out all those big breaths is to have fewer of them in the first place. It really is the, the best way to do it. I, I know that's a little, bit of un, a little bit of an unsatisfying answer, but there's no shortcut technically to this stuff. You just have to get better at, rec at recording it in the first place. Um, but if you do have to edit it out, you know, you can begin to pick and choose. Often you'll notice stuff in your own audio that you think is, uh, God, I'm just breathing quickly. It sounds terrible. And um, then people listen to it. They don't, they have, they have no idea. So also don't just listen to yourself and play it for other people. You can also get a, um, get a pop filter. Uh, so that's, you know, well, this is an example. This is a kind of a wind guard pop filter. There's other kinds of pop filters. Um, a, a good shortcut is you can actually take a take a if you take a hanger and an old stocking and just stretch the stocking over the hanger like in a circle and put it in front of your mic and it, it'll it won't cut out the breaths it'll cut out the kind of the plosives the kind of popping spitting sound you get so there's a good audio pro tip uh, for you we do a whole webinar on improving your audio so I can uh, I can send that material around as well um, so it looks like it's 344. I'm, I'm still going to race through the end of this, uh, John, then we can, you know, we can get as many questions in um, as possible. So invest in basic equipment. Okay, so let's just quickly talk about microphones. This is like some serious audio theory in about 30 seconds. But so different microphones have different polar patterns. This is the, the area that they record from, right? So Mi microphones, some record omnidirectional, like the one you see on the left. Others record in a cardioid pattern, like the one you see uh, second to the left or super cardioid or figure eight. So, and you can get a mic that specializes in one of these patterns. Um, and you can get one that has different settings. Like the, I think one of the Yetis that someone was talking about, you can actually set it in all these different settings. Omni is great if you're recording a whole negotiation around a table because you want to get everyone. Cardioid is great for just one person like me. That's what I'm using now. Figure eight is great if you're doing an interview across a table. You place that figure eight pattern mic between you. It's going to get you, but not as much on the side. So kind of know your polar patterns when you shop for mics and kind of know, try to get a sense of the, you know, the, the, the way your mic records. Like my cardioid mic here, you know, I'm speaking into it. And as I turn the mic around, I'm speaking the same volume. It should be getting lower. I hope it is. <laughs> and, and um, you know, you, yeah, the Yeti blue has all four settings. Someone says, so, um, well, let's talk about Yeti's for a second. So, so, so this is a list of my microphone recommendations. I, I don't like, here's why I don't like the, so for those of you who don't know, Blue is this consumer um, audio company and they make these, or Yeti rather is the company, the Blue is the name of the mic. They, they make these kind of relatively inexpensive, really, really cool looking microphones. And I don't like them for two reasons. So one is because they allow you to do all four of those polar settings, they don't really specialize. I find their cardioid um, setting is, is really not very good. Like it's picking up, it, it's not really cardioid. It's picking up a lot more in the back. So yeah, and Snowball is the other one. It's a very inexpensive mic. So I find the Yeti mics just to have a very thin sound to them. They're like really high in the, in sort of the trebles and really low in the bass. And you can fix this if you know how to process your audio, but I just don't love the sound. However, they do look really, really cool. And you know, I think they, they, I think people like, like them for that reason. And some of them like the Snowball are like really, really cheap. I think it's like $50. So it's kind of hard to argue with that. And if you know, I wouldn't, I, I would much rather you get a Yeti mic than record off, off your laptop mic or probably even your Apple earbuds. But I do think there's other options. 
but as an as an entry mic, I think they're fine. And, and some people, you know, like like Debris has had a good experience with it. That's totally fine. It also could just be, you know, my voice. Um, it doesn't sound great. But I've heard a lot of voice actors you work with also not speak very highly of them. But again, they're totally better than nothing <laughs> and relatively inexpensive. But here are my recommendations. Again, I will, um, you know, I'll put all the stuff in the in the materials I send you. One distinction to be aware of is the first two mics here, um, particularly that Rode NT, it's a USB mic. So you can plug these USB mics right into a USB port in your computer. Whereas the more expensive mics like the Shure SM7B, which is what I'm using, or the RE20, um, they require something called an XLR. I'm, I, I don't, I'm afraid to show it to you here because I'm afraid to like pull my mic out, but it's just a thicker cable that, that is for professional audio and it transmits audio signals better than a USB cable will. So, you know, it requires a little more technical know-how to use these mics, but if you are serious about sounding good, I, I recommend considering what amounts to a $500 investment in a Shure SM7B or an RE20. It's what almost every podcaster, I mean, you see them, if you, if you look on, even on the news, they're using SM7Bs and RE20s as like kind of broadcast mics. So they're really, really good. If you want to get one of these, you also need a little box to convert your XLR into USB so you can plug it into your computer. So the one most people use is called this, the Focusrite uh, is, the, is the company and it's a little box called the Scarlet. It's an audio interface, technically. It's like a $150. Um, then there's the Zoom H2, which is a, 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 not to be confused with Zoom, you know, the Zoom we're on now, the, 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 the video conference software. But Zoom makes portable audio recorders and mics. And the Zoom H2 is excellent. It's, it's a mic and an audio recorder, but a sort of little hard drive inside. So when this pandemic's over and you're doing more work in the field, interviewing, uh, it's fantastic. Um, final thing, just some other thing, bits of gear to, to think about. Um, if you are going to be reading a lot, uh, you might want to consider getting a teleprompter app for your iPad or iPhone. And you can, you can either, either attach the prompter to a, mic, uh, to a camera and, and, and speak and record on, you know, onto your iPad or iPhone or some other camera you have. You can also just set it up right behind your webcam. And, and you can even set some that are, respond to your voice so they'll advance as you talk, which can really come in handy. You know, if you really need to read something, um, read the script, super useful. I mentioned pop filters. Um, one thing I don't have here is you will need a stand for your mic. I use a simple desk stand, but there's all kinds of stands you can get. Um, and finally, pillows are your best friend when setting up your audio space. Don't underestimate just literally piling a few pillows up on the wall next to your, uh, or in, the, in front of the door next to your recording, in your recording room um, can make a huge difference. Um, yeah, someone's rec recommending the road, the road mini wireless. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I, I know folks who use it. It's really, really good. Um, finally in, invest in professional help. So don't be afraid if you really are serious about this to spend a little money, assuming you can get a hold of a little money, but if you are going to spend money on vendors, make sure you're investing in something, right? Don't just have someone develop one video, but have them like create some, create a style guide, create like a set of template slides or a character or training, right? Invest in training, use your kind of vendor dollars wisely. Um, and I, I like to think of this good, fast and cheap formulation. And you can have things, you can only have two out of the three, right? You can have something good and fast, but it's going to cost you. Um, you can have something good and cheap, but it's going to take forever, or you can have it fast and cheap, but it's not going to be very good. I think that's kind of you because you might not need it to be very good, right? You might just need it quickly. And so that there's if you are going to invest in 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 um in vendors, that's a good rule of thumb. I've listed here some of the um platforms you can use to get a hold of freelancers. On the left hand side of the cheaper ones, Upwork, Fiverr, 99 Designs. You're gonna see a lot of you know international folks in these platforms. They're a little hard to use, but they can be great. You can get something designed or written for a hundred dollars, you know. Um, Behance and Dribble are a little higher end, especially Dribble. These are re Dribble's really for agencies that are hiring, you know, dozens and dozens of creatives. But Behance is Adobe's own creative freelancer platform, and and you can um, you can find great graphic designers and artists there. So if you want to kind of spend a little bit of money, maybe maybe you have a thousand dollars for a project, um, you know, Behance could be a great place to go. And finally, there's us. Briefly, you can always um, call us if you have a a bigger project that you want to do, um, a legal content project or 
some training. Um, all right. I think, right. I think that's it for our actual content. I'm going to do a super quick pitch and then we can get into the Q and a, if that's all right, John. Um, so, sure. you know, as I mentioned briefly, my company, we produce legal content for, you know, legal aid organizations, um, courts, other legal organizations. Um, we are launching a much lower cost subscription service, um, which is designed to support lawyers in making great legal content. And there's a lot more information about this on our site and I'll send that over to you. But basically the, you know, the idea is for a, it's $2,000 a year for an organization, for a whole organization, not of, this includes an entire law school. Um, and you get eight trainings that are kind of more detailed versions of this one on different legal content topics for everything from plain language writing to improving your audio, um, improving screencasts, motion graphics, infographics, just all kinds of stuff. We we're, we're actually doing a, a bonus, we're going to do a bonus ninth um, uh, a presentation on writing with a bunch of comedy writers to help talk about how to write concisely, which I think should be a lot of fun. Um, and then there's a, a, a another, like a sort of more expensive version that also includes 20 hours of consulting time over the course of the year with us. So for organizations producing a bunch of content that, you know, probably can't afford $50,000 to hire an agency, but need some time they can draw upon our, our writers, our designers, our animators, motion graphics folks, um, audio people, et cetera. So please take a look. And also I'd love some feedback. We haven't really been talking to many law libraries or law schools about this. I think it's a really interesting fit. So, you know, if you're willing, I'd love, I'd love some feedback if you have a minute to take a look at, at, um, at what we're offering. Um, so that's the pitch. Um, thank you. And now let's dive into some Q&A. There's a bunch of questions we can look at back here, but please drop any other questions. Thank you, Mark. Please drop some other questions into the chat that you may have. In the results of the Instapoll, I put a little Instapoll up about uh, whether you think there'd be an uh, interest in Camtasia training for law faculty. 13 people said yes. Um, three said no. Um, that's way more than I expected, to be honest. <laughs> so maybe that's something that we'll look into uh, for a future webinar. Um, yeah, and we're and, and and as part of our subscription service, there's at least three trainings that'll be relevant to this. There'll be a direct screencast training. There'll be an audio improve your audio training. Um, oh, John asked about accessibility. Um, it's a huge topic. Um, so, do you have any like particular? Let me let me jump in on that. Yeah. So so the the. You, you do what you can, but so, so we're, you do what you can. Yeah. we're, we're recording this um, and we're going to get a transcript automatically from zoom and we'll post that as well. Um, and we'll probably pull the MP3 as well. And we hope that all of those things uh, uh, incrementally uh, add to the accessibility for, for, for this um, because zoom gives you your, can, can do your recordings and will give you transcripts that aren't too bad. Um, I almost feel like that should be a default, but, but if, if you've got a law school that's doing, you know, dozens or hundreds of hours of video uh, Zooms, you know, every day or every week, the, um, you're going to have to manage that and there's going to have to be a production flow for, for all that uh, content. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the, the, the upside is there's more better automated tools to let you do some modicum of accessibility. Um, uh, the downside is you have to do the extra work to make that actually uh, useful. A quick and easy thing is that YouTube and Vimeo both support really easy captioning now. So you can kind of enter your, enter the captions in kind of live with the time code as you go through the video. It's good for translation also. If you have like a, a speak, another, you know, a native speaker in their language, they can just go through and put the captions in. So that's, that's a really easy way to add some accessibility. You no, know, those players aren't technically compliant with like the full, I forgot the name of the um, compliance standard, but it's, um, there are a whole bunch of really cool, I think it's able player. There's a couple of really cool accessible players you can embed in your website that are kind of being developed now. And it's a whole movement. None of them are really in the mainstream yet. And I'm, I think they're hoping YouTube will eventually adopt their standards, but that's <laughs> something to look into. I think it's, it's a fascinating world. But um, the bottom line is, like John said, for accessibility, you're just, you're always scrambling to do what you can. It's never fully compliant uh, online. 
but you kind of do your best. I know that's an unsatisfying que- uh, answer, but it's a big question. <laughs> oh, um, okay. So a few more, wow, a few more big questions here. So, all right, I'm going to have to punt on a few questions. So we, we have um, recommendations on best practices for getting content out there once you make it. So that, so I'm going to say, I mean, this is a huge, huge topic, right? And it is, all I'll say for now is there are just no shortcuts, right? This is this is worth an entire eight training series on its own. Um, I guess if I had to give some, some quick, quick advice is I would reassure you that it, it is hard, right? So if you kind of throw your stuff out there, no one watches it, don't be, um, you know, don't be discouraged. That's been every great content creator has had that experience. But I would say start with communities and people that you already know. That's the only way you can really start. Unless you're going to pay, maybe this is obvious, I don't know. But I, you know, you unless you're going to start, unless you're going to really develop a marketing strategy and get into it, um, you just need to start with 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 um, you know with people and communities you know and, and grow from there. Um, but again, we're, you know, we, we we're going to actually do a f- we're going to do a free webinar next year on marketing and outreach. It's going to be a super quick overview like this. But if you sign up for our our, um, our webinar list, I'll make sure you get that. But it's a it's a huge and interesting topic. John asks about design, colors, and other techniques. Again, John, it's a it's a huge it's a huge huge topic. Um, so. If I had to give any advice on this now, I'll say that people tend to underestimate how hard graphic design is. So tell me if you if you disagree with this, John. And and, and so uh, it's sort of like law. People think they can do it themselves. You can't. You, 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 so I, I actually think the if, if you're interested in graphic design, you can jump on one of those education platforms I mentioned like Udemy or, 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 um, you know, uh, YouTube and get tons of um, free stuff to learn on graphic design. But I think this is a great place to spend a few hundred dollars to hire that really talented Filipino designer on Upwork or something like that, or even Behance. I would actually get, if you really want to make things look good, I would get someone to develop a style guide for you. If, you know, if you can afford it, if not, you know, you'll scrape it together on your own. But anyway, John, it's a huge, um, it is a huge, huge topic. And, um, you know, I would encourage you to, to um, you know, just start learning whatever free stuff you can. I know that's also not a very satisfying answer, but it's a huge, huge question. Um, so uh, we have a question. Oh, would a Shure SM7B make me sound significantly better? My voice is a bit high now. I'm using Yeti, but I can return it. Um, I think it's make yeah, yeah, I think it makes you sound better, but I think I actually think, and I, I, I suspect most voice professionals would agree with me on this more important than your mic will be your room. So what I would do is record yourself in your, in, with your Yeti where you are now, and then go into your closet. I mean, for real, or go under your bed and surround it with, with pillows and then see how you sound. And you might actually be really surprised your Yeti might end up, end up sounding good. So, cause you know, the, the shore is a, it's a big investment, right? It's like, it's going to cost you. And actually one thing that's, you, you can't get discounts on mics now at all. You can, there's no, even if no matter where you go, everything, they're, they're sold not out. just, yeah. I mean, you can't, I mean, it's worse in September when every teacher in the entire country, the entire world was buying a microphone. So it's expensive. So I would, I would try to get the most out of that Yeti first, right? Like, really improve your room, improve your space. And just, you know, Google around YouTube and look for like content on this. There's, there's tons. Um, so that's my advice. I wouldn't throw out the Yeti just yet. I would try to improve other aspects of your recording first. Also, yeah, was, was, yes. So, so uh, I wanted to get at least one, this, this question that came into the actual Q and a, um, a lot, and a lot of schools I know are using Penapto, which is a, uh, uh, mm. uh, an enterprise sort of classroom recording and streaming service. Do you have any, um, any, any experience with Panopto? No, and, I've never and, used Panopto. I keep hearing about it though now. So, but I don't, I don't have any experience using it directly, but it's, it, it you know. Well, I, I will say that, uh, so, so we've, we've taken the recordings from Panopto from, for, from a lot of our Cali conferences. And, and the good news is we could get recordings easily because it's a system that will turn on when the session starts and turn off when it's over. The bad news is, 
it's a, it's almost always the camera placement is a wide shot of the whole room. And so you can, but that's the idea behind it, right? It's yeah. It's like meant to make that look good. Yeah. 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 And so, and so the short answer is, I think if you could, if you could, if, if there's a better camera setup and lighting for the instructor, then that can be fed into the panopto that, you know, if there's ways to make it be- make make the quality of the presentation better, then it can be one for making uh, quality videos. If it, if it's just the 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 camera is glued to the to the back of the room and you're in the front of the room, um, you know, you can judge for yourself that the, that the quality of the presentation is not going to be very good. In yeah. my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Deborah makes some other recommendations. I, yeah. So Audiate is uh, that's an, that's TechSmith's. It's an audio caption service. I think it's good, actually. Yeah. So I think Audiate is. I don't know how much it costs now, but it's a, it's a it's a um it's a good option. I've never used Zoom's uh, Zoom's captioning function, but that would be interesting to to try that out. We, we've used their auto um, auto transcript function that that comes like after the fact, uh, to good to good effect. The transcript. Yeah. 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 Um. So. So Jill asked to green to green screen or not to green screen. I mean, it's a subjective um, question. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to think for the kinds of things that most of us are doing to not green street green screen. No offense, John. I think. No, I, 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 I'll, I'll agree. I'll agree. I, I think that again, there's a subjectivity to this. I think that the problem with green screen is that it just, it abstracts things so much. And if it's not done well, it can look goofy and it draws attention to the goofiness. You know, if you're floating next to your text on your deck, it's just going to look, it's hard to do really well. So, so I, I kind of figure, you know, do some decent lighting. Someone asked about lighting. I'll answer that question in a second. I, so my instinct is like, not, don't worry about green screen. It's also another thing that can get in your way. And I say, get everything out of your way focus on you and your presentation. Another technical thing is, you know, to, to kind of get in the way is, is an issue. So that's my general thinking on, on green screens. So, oh, hang on, let me get back to the chat here. Um, so lighting more questions and then let's wrap it up. Yeah. Oh, as someone asked about the subscription service, is there, is it available to individual faculty as well? So that's a good question. So not yet, but if you are interested, please stay in touch and email me because I'm thinking about making an individual subscription because we're getting some interest, not just law faculty. It's, you know, individual lawyers at legal aid organizations. You know, we can't come down the price too, too much, but we could, you know, come up with payment plans and other ways of, of, um, of doing it. So, so I'm going to send you a follow-up and you can, you know, reply and let me know because it could be great to be able to offer it to folks. Um, Ethan asked contact info on the website, I'm assuming that means for me, um, yes, I'm going to send you way too much info shortly uh, after this. Um, lighting tips. Jill asked lighting tips for office environment. Another huge topic, but I'll give you the quick. So, so just to give you an idea, so I'm sitting now, right? So I'm in, I'm, in a, I'm in upstate New York and it's getting dark really fast right now. And so what you want to do is have at least two sources of light. You want to have what's called a key light, which is a light that kind of lights you head on as your main light, but then that's going to cast some shadows. So you want to have a a fill light on the side. So, you know, a lot of um, uh, folks are getting these ring lights, which are a key light that goes right in front. I'm sure some of you have seen these, right? You can buy a ring light. They're great. They go right in front of your computer on a little stand. They're designed to be a key light that doesn't cast too many shadows. So you don't necessarily need a, need a, um, Oh my God, it's Friday afternoon. You don't need, you don't necessarily need the fill light. So I would recommend just getting a ring light. Yeah, like John has there. Or I literally have two lamps set up. One right in front of me as a key, one to the side as a fill. You can even see, you know, as I, as I block the light, you can see where the shadows are and that will do the trick. At minimum, just make sure the light's on you and not behind you. That alone will make a huge difference. Um, so... That's how, another thing just to think about when composing your background. Mine is not composed that well, but you think about the rule of threes. So you want to have your kind of have your background divided into three. So shooting into a corner like I am can be really nice. I've got the corner of the room. Then I've got this corner of this bookshelf. Those are my super quick tips on, on, on lighting and, and visual composition. 
Um, someone mentions f- a four play media for audio description. I, that is also something I've been hearing a lot about, which sounds really, really interesting. So this is for, right. This is a, a, re- a really cool accessibility tool. Um, yeah. Anyway, really interesting stuff. Mark, how do you sign up for your blog or blog post? You can sign up right in our website, but actually just wait till I send you this follow-up email. I'll probably get it out tomorrow. Um, I'm going to send it to everyone who signed up and you can just sign up right there and you'll get, um, you'll get our, you'll get in our list. And we, we really only send out substantive stuff. Um, you know, not very often. Philip says, uh, Philip said Pepperdine. Oh yeah. You, so yeah. So Philip uses the Zoom live transcript feature on all events um, for ADA reasons. It works okay to very good, depending upon the speaker, the diction and vocabulary, like any auto system. Right. There are occasions where we use a third party with the default to Zoom. That's good to know that it's actually fair to fair to middling, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, OK, Mark, thanks for the po- thanks for the kind words and positive energy. That's great. Um, I want to make sure that I haven't missed any questions here. Nope, you've, you've covered almost everything. I've been also scrolling and uh, making sure that uh, I bring things up. Um, Adam, thank you very much. Um, that, that was great. We'll, we'll make sure the recording gets posted um, today or tomorrow, or might, maybe, maybe I'll be lazy and wait till Monday. Um, but- Actually, John, <laughs> if, you, if you send a link to me, I'll just stick it in that same email and I'll get that out. Though that reality probably expected Monday at this point. So. <laughs> All, right. All right. We'll take care of that. Folks, thanks so much. Uh, please stay healthy and take care of yourselves and uh, see you next time. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.